Welcome to Short Takes. If this is your first visit, we are the Alabama Takes' very own talk show, released every Friday. I'm the host and editor-in-chief of the website. My name is Blaine Duncan. I don't think our guest today needs a, a lot of exposition. Uh, I'm willing to bet all of our viewers here in Alabama and across the South know this gentleman. Uh, so the only preamble I'll offer is that I'm excited. I'm really happy to get to talk to him today. I've been a fan of his and his show for years, years and years. I think I've been watching and listening since 96 or so. So probably not as long as some of you people, but definitely I am a fan. It's my pleasure to welcome ESPN, SEC Network's very own Mr. Paul Feinbaum on the show. Hey, Paul. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a great pleasure to uh, to join you today. You're very kind for for joining us, uh, and because you're about to enter a chaotic and and busy time of year for you, uh, and it's already been a little chaotic on the news front. You you're dealing with and commenting on the NIL issue, which is a huge factor for the NCAA. You're probably commenting a lot on um, the playoff expansion, the possibility, the rumors, the all those things. I'm sure you've exasperated all your thoughts on those. Th- two topics and that's what your show is for so is it but there's there anything you'd like to say that might be something you haven't gotten to comment on on your show or you haven't had the time to say i do think uh, this is one of the most exciting periods in college athletic history and when the nil went into effect on july 1st it really was one of those seminal moments that you just stop and, and think about because the idea that the college athletes are going to get something uh, is, is revolutionary. And you know, many have used uh, historical language to describe how athletes have been treated in the past. But to me, it's just it's been it's been really enjoyable to watch them proclaim, uh, "Hey, I've got this deal on on in, on Instagram or Twitter or TikTok or whatever." And uh, you know, I, I I didn't think I would ever see this day. So it's, that that would be my my takeaway from a uh, really bizarre summer, much better than last summer. When we're, we were debating uh, almost up until the beginning of September whether we'd have a college football season or not. Yeah. You know, it's still, I'm an Alabama fan. I'll just go out and lay, lay my cards on the table. We might have some Auburn fans coming in or our Tennessee fans coming in. It just hit me the other day, uh, walking down the outside. Alabama won the national championship in a pandemic. And it just, sometimes, I think that's something that's going to hit me every couple of years. I'll just think, we had a pandemic. And uh, Nick Saban was able to to fight through it and and win. It's just such a – last year was so bizarre, and you're right. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think Saban won that national championship at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, which goes to show why he is Nick Saban and, and, and the greatest of all time because, you know, everyone was in a panic. We, we all were. And I think, uh, you know, books will be written for years. Uh, leadership uh, studies will be, will be made and completed about what – what, what people did during a crisis and mm-hmm. you know Saban never left his office he, even though he should even though state law told him he needed to go home he stayed there um, and it turned out to be the right decision because he he knew that was where he was in the best position to to figure out how to get through it while our other coaches were home watching Netflix with their kids Saban <laughs> was developing a plan and uh, yeah the, the other issue was would he have a healthy team and you know, I, I say this, not because it, it happened intentionally, but so many of his players, you know, caught uh, COVID early on that by the season they were in good shape. The only person that, that waited till the end to get it was was Nick Saban. <laughs> That's right. I envy that man's work ethic. I really do. Uh, so speaking of work ethic, you, I'm sure, have a good one because you have to. In the fall, I would imagine your days are so hectic. It, 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 can you put it in perspective for someone like me who I don't get to see the behind the scenes stuff. How how hectic is it? How many hours do you get of sleep uh, during the football season on the weekends of those things? Well, let me go back to the last normal football season because this season is, is oh, there's so so many things up in the air. Even as we get close to it, uh, travel is a little less certain with, mm-hmm. with, with certain things than it used to be. But in in 2017, 18, and 19, I had I had a schedule, especially in, in 19, where 
once we got to mid, mid to late August until the national championship game, I traveled five nights a week, which was, was something I always wanted to do. And when it was over, I, I wasn't sure if I would live. Um, and it, essentially, it, it consisted of uh, doing our, our program. In, in, I'm in Charlotte. That's where the SEC network is mm-hmm. on Monday. On Monday night, I would rush to the airport to fly to New York. And then at six o'clock the next morning, uh, I would be at the ESPN studios uh, to, to go on the get up show and then first take and other shows. And then we would do our show in the afternoon. I would do that Tuesday and Wednesday. I would fly back home on Thursday morning. And then on Friday morning, I would go to the SEC site where our, our weekend show would, would be. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I could be in Tuscaloosa or College Station, Texas. Right. And then from there on Saturday, I would go to Bristol, Connecticut. Uh, so I, I could do the Sports Center from, from ESPN headquarters. And it, it became... So, I mean, I didn't want to admit this, uh, but I mean, it was so overwhelming because I, I wasn't sleeping. Uh, I was really having a hard time. Uh, you're so vulnerable. And I, I, did, I got sick toward the end of the season. And I, yeah. I joked that I had COVID-18 uh, because we didn't <laughs> know about uh, 19 yet. But I had something. And, and my wife, who's a physician, you know, she thought maybe I, maybe I was the first person in America to get COVID, although it turned out that I, I, I did not have it. I did take the antibody. And, uh but it was uh, it was it was one of the most exciting and 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 exasperating years of my life for somebody that uh, is entering the mid sixties. Um, I I I did it, and I don't think I really want to do it again. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was it was pretty exciting because you really didn't know where you were. And I know as a, as a young reporter, I was a newspaper reporter in my in my youth. Uh, I always wanted to live in New York, and mm-hmm. pretty much did live in New York uh, for three days a week, and uh, never again. I, I'm intrigued by um, touring musicians, politicians, especially national politicians, and, and then you guys. Be, and just what does it do to your body? How do you combat being so tired? Well, you, you just learn, uh, you know, again, again, when I was 20, 20 years old, sleep was not a big deal. Right, um, right. But, you know, 40 years later, it became a big deal. I mean, I'm pretty careful with, with eating. Uh, That's good. I I try to exercise, even though you know you're staying at hotels in Manhattan, and you're you know you, they may be equipped, they may not be. Uh-huh. So I mean, ultimately, you just uh, I mean, there there was one night, uh, Blake. We you know flying to New York late at night is dangerous because it, all it takes is one thunderstorm. We're we're halfway there, and you've got you've got you've got LaGuardia, you got Kennedy, you got Newark, you got Boston, you got Philadelphia, all these. You know, if you just look at a map sometime mm-hmm. and there were thunderstorms in, 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 in New York City and they started diverting planes at, at two o'clock in the morning. I found I found myself in Baltimore and finally we landed at Kennedy, which wasn't the, the airport we I intended to land. But the other airport had shut down at four forty five a.m. I, I got to the hotel at five thirty, took a shower and was at the studio at six thirty. I mean, no sleep. And. And I'm thinking to myself, it, it been a, you know, I, I was trying to remember back to what dorm I uh, was in in college at the last time I pulled in an all-nighter like that. Um, but you, you, you kind of laugh about it later. Uh, and, you know, you, you, you find out that nobody really cares how little sleep you've had. <laughs> they don't. That's very true. But, uh, yeah, but you do such a great job despite sleep or, or getting a lot of sleep in the – maybe more in the summer. Um, so the upcoming se- season's a few weeks away. Uh, are you excited? Are you hesitant? Are you, um, you know, where are, give me where you are on a gauge. Yeah, let me tell you this. As somebody who's covered college football since college in the late 70s, uh, I don't mm-hmm. think I've ever been more excited about a season because last year I, I didn't go to, I didn't get to a game. Uh, you, know, mm-hmm. our, you know, I work for ESPN, which is owned by Disney and mm-hmm. their protocols were very difficult and they, they only allowed the very few people at the, at the sites so, I mean, I, I watched the college football season from home, which was bizarre. Um, so I, I cannot wait. Uh, I, uh, I, I am so excited. Uh, we're going, I'm going to be in Atlanta uh, the opening weekend for the Alabama-Miami game. And just to experience that again, uh, to me, is, is something that uh, I, I'm really looking forward to. Uh, there's such excitement out there from fans who – can't wait to get back and do what they love. They love doing. Now, now they were, they were, listen, there are fans that did it last year. Mm-hmm. I'm happy for them, and uh, I'm, and fortunately, most of them made it through it pretty well. 
That's true. The larger crowds are, uh, in your case, just the crowds, the football asthma, uh, atmospherics, that's, that's kind of getting you pumped up. Yeah. And I mean, as somebody who, you know, I've always been on campuses on, on Saturday, but working mm-hmm. at ESPN, uh, my first year I traveled with, with College Game Day. And then mm-hmm. when the SEC Network started, I, I started traveling with the SEC show. And there's something there's something unique about, you know, arriving on a college campus at 6 a.m. on a Saturday morning yeah. and nobody is awake and you're, you know, going to your bus and getting ready for your your, your ESPN hits and then your show and, and then to watch the crowd start to uh, gather. I mean, there's something really unique about it. Um, and, you know, it's hard to describe the quiet stillness of, of a college of a college campus, you know, with the stadium right behind you, and to know that eight hours, or in some cases, twelve or thirteen hours later, that will be the epicenter of the college football world. Like like you were talking about uh, in my days in Tuscaloosa, I pulled some all nighters and I experienced that quiet, <laughs> and it is. Two students, uh, you know, waiting for us when we get there. So uh, I always try to go by and see them. I'm like, going, uh, I mean, I I, I, I I look at them and, you know, as an adult now in the autumn of my career, and I go, you guys must be crazy. Then I remember when I was a school, when I was a student, uh, I camped out for tickets, uh, didn't phase us in the least. It was a party. Mm-hmm. That's true. Uh, let's get into our four questions for the show. So here's our first one. You do have a very clear perspective on football and sports in general. What do you think our love of sports and maybe even specifically college football in the South says about us as a, as a people in America? I like what it says. And I, I know a lot mm-hmm. of critics uh, get mad every time something terrible happens. Uh, you know, a guy poisons a tree or, mm-hmm. uh, you know, there's an outbreak. Or, but to me, it, it shows it, it, that college football is, I think, the most unique sport in this country. You don't have to have been a graduate of, the, of a school to be a fan. In, in fact, I mean, we all we all know, uh, you know, tens of thousands, I don't know personally, but tens of thousands of Alabama fans who who probably have never even been on campus, but that's their mm-hmm. team and that's what they love. And that and because there are no other distractions, uh, you know, Birmingham, Huntsville, Montgomery, Mobile. This is not like Atlanta, Charlotte, mm-hmm. uh, even Nashville now, where they're yeah. you know professional teams. I mean, we were college football fans Mm -hmm. and it it lives most of the year. And I think the fact that others make fun of us, make us even more, uh, you know, we we bow up and and want to fight them even harder. Um, (laughs) So, and and I I think it it doesn't hurt that we're pretty good at it. Uh, I mean, the fact that, you know, we had a run where Alabama won the national championship in 2009, Auburn won it in 10, mm-hmm. Alabama won it in 11, 12, Auburn nearly won it again in 13. Mm-hmm. I mean, you think about that run there, 4, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, for, for five years, short of one play, uh, the state of Alabama would have held the national championship for five straight years. You can't find any place like that because there is no place like that. Yeah. With you being my guest, I'm going to cheat a little. I want to follow up on one. Uh, my first question, that is, being one. What's a moment where you learned the most about X's and O's of football more, and, and more just clicked in place for you? Yeah, I I, I am not a, a former player. so Right. I, I try to defer on X's and O's, but being around former players, all, and I, which I am, I, I traveled for, for seven years with Tim Tebow. <laughs> and when you're with those guys, you hear them talking about these, these things. That, so you learn – from that, I mean, I, I'm a fan, uh, and when I, I would say countless people that call in our show know more about the game on the field than I do, mm-hmm. uh, but I also try to talk to coaches, uh, friends of mine who are former co- former coaches love to talk, and they will tell you about what's happened. So I, I'm always learning. Uh, I mean, it, it's almost like I I feel like I'm going to a, a fantasy camp every summer, relearning the game. But but one thing about the game of college football, it changes. Uh, you know what yeah. what was once cool is no longer in vogue. So uh, you do have to keep up with that. But uh, I I just I'm always trying to learn. I'm, I am yeah you know, at, at at my core a very curious person. Yeah, that's good. I, I'm like you. I didn't play in high school, and just for me, I guess I just didn't have the size and. 
the X's and O's amaze me. I can get so interested, but I never, I don't think I ever grasp them fully. It's just, especially when you have someone like, uh, well, we'll just take Coach Saban or any of those guys that you have, and they start drawing up some things on on your screen. I'm, I, it blows my mind. Well, the one thing I try not to do, and it, 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 it can be a problem when you're sitting on a, on a set on television with three or four former players, you don't, as a, as, as a non-player, as a lay person, you, you don't want to try to get too deep in the woods because you'll get exposed. So it's awkward sometimes. I mean, you're, you know, I mean, the question is, well, do you think Alabama's offensive line is going to be able to match up against Clemson's uh, defensive front? And I'm, uh, I know the guy sitting next to me played defensive tackle in, in, in LSU and, and in the NFL. Mm-hmm. And I, so I, I, I try to be very broad um, because the audience knows if you don't know what you're talking about. And yeah, yeah. I mean, this is off the record, of course, but I don't, how, how am I supposed to know what I'm talking about uh, in describing <laughs> what it feels like to be down there uh, in, a, in a game like that? I've, I've never, I mean, I've been, I've been to a bunch of games, but I've never played in one of those. Yeah, and you guys have a, such a good crew to, to help uh, make up for any of the, of the things that you might miss. Uh, so it seems like you have a high tolerance for, for bullshit. What drives you to anger? I try never to get very upset, but, but I, I can't, I mean, what, what drives me to anger is hypocrisy. Um, people that will uh, just blatantly lie. Uh, and I think some of that is, you know, formed from, from my newspaper background. Mm-hmm. I started as a newspaper reporter. I thought when I was in my 20s working in, in Birmingham in the newspaper business that I was going to change the world. I mean, I was, I was that idealistic. And, and I really, and, but I think that's what drove me. Uh, I really wanted to clean the world up. I, I thought there was, you know, in, in my little world of college sports, you know, cheating really bothered me. Now it's like, who cares? Uh, mm-hmm. But back then I, I, I felt like it was, it, the coaches and, and, and boosters were taking advantage of, of young people who didn't know any better. And so that, that really did, ang- and it still angers me today, except that there's just, uh, now that it's been legalized, <laughs> it, it's hard to really look under rocks and expose people. But, you know, just from a, from a, a host of a, of a show, I hate it when somebody will call you and say something blatantly untrue. Or uh, I have very little tolerance for, for prejudice. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and and, and I, I try not to wear it on my sleeve. Uh, and, I, and I will let certain things go by, and I've been criticized. Well, why didn't you stop that guy? Because I, 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 I have a theory that by calling less attention to something, sometimes is better than just you know, you know, being a a, a stage actor and and trying to act like I'm personally offended. I mean, I, you hear a lot of stuff. You just have to manage it. But those are a couple of things that really do anger me. Yeah, I've seen you call out the untruths a, uh, a few times, and I enjoy that. I, I like it when. Uh, when someone points out lies, it's good. Well, every once in a while, it happens. In a, in a, in a, I mean, one of the most famous things I've ever been involved with was <laughs> Nick Saban. Uh, we were having a conversation on the set of, our, our, of SEC Media Days about six, five or six years ago, and I just asked him why he didn't suspend the player who had uh, been caught that summer w- in Louisiana with a gun. Right. And he blew up. But he was, well, I later found out he was looking for a reason to blow up, and I gave it to him. And then I did something that you are, I didn't realize this was against the law in Alabama, but I interrupted Coach Saban. And that <laughs> sent him into orbit. Uh, and when I interrupted again, I thought he was going to hit me. Um, but it turned out to be some of the great, greatest television the, the SEC networks ever had. Uh, and he called me a couple of hours later and apologized. But he got what he wanted out of it. His wife told me this later. He said, you know, Nick got what he wanted and you got what you wanted. And uh, you know, Nick was able to stand up for his players. And from my standpoint, it looked like somebody finally was going to stand up to the bully. And, you know, I know Alabama people don't want to think of their coach as the bully, but he is. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he is. <laughs> so I, I feel like you've done a good job, maybe an excellent job, of maintaining a private life while still being very, very public. Uh, it's almost like me, the people who call into your show, who watch your show, we know you, but... We, I don't know that I have a lot of notions of what you do outside of writing and hosting and, and doing your job at ESPN. So is there anything that um, maybe people wouldn't know, particularly fans of, of the SEC network, that you're willing to share or just say something about? I'm pretty willing to talk about things, except I, I, I do very much believe in in a, a cone of privacy for my, for my wife. Uh, yes. She's yes. a physician. 
And it was more difficult in Birmingham when we lived there uh, because it was, it was, I mean, you, you, you you get to be known, and uh, mm-hmm. but but I, I never wanted to. Uh, you know, she had a, she had her life, and, and I just uh, and even though I've talked about her before, people say, "Why don't you why don't you bring her on the show?" I, I, I feel like she it, it's better to to draw a line there. Uh, although she, uh, I, I don't take her to games with me. I I, I try. Yeah, I mean, I've been to some. Don't misunderstand me, but mm-hmm. I, I, I try to. To me, that's important uh, that she not get overwhelmed by you know whatever happens to me. But but I'm not really, uh, you yeah, know, but, but I, I mean, you can't help but be a public person. I used to, uh, when, when we lived in Birmingham, we'd go to Walmart on Saturday and, and you know, to avoid getting recognized, I would, I would wear a hat or some sunglasses. Mm-hmm. I mean, we wouldn't like be past the, uh, the greeter. And somebody was, hey, Paul. And my wife would like look at me and say, boy, that's really a great disguise. Um, and you know, but, so I, I finally gave up on that. But you know, in, in, in Charlotte, uh, I do not get recognized as much. I mean, there, there's, after, you, after you're on ESPN for seven or eight years, yeah, people are going to stop you. I mean, I, I, it's gotten to the point where uh, I've had people walk up to me at airports or places and go, man, you, anybody ever tell you you look just like Paul Feinbaum? I go, happens all the time. And they'll walk away. Because uh, and it's 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 one of my great uh, inside jokes, but yeah, I, I don't mind. I mean, if you're if you're in the public eye, you better be willing to embrace it. And, and I do take it seriously because I, I know that people uh, you leave impressions on people. I remember I was a little kid and got blown off by Major League Baseball players for autographs, uh-huh. and, and I, I, I've never forgotten that. And and I, you try not to. Sometimes you can't help it. Uh, you're trying to get out of a, a football stadium. You're trying to get to the airport. You're in an airport. And my wife, I mean, we'll be on vacation and, you know, we're going through the airport and some guy walks up and says, hey, can I take a picture? And and you're fine, but you're like, you're looking your way. And my, and my wife will say, oh, let me, let me take one more. I'm like, going, <laughs> please, <laughs> let's just keep moving. But uh, but she she's on the side of the fan and I'm looking and going, I really need to get to this plane and it's leaving in three minutes, but that's okay. Um, but yeah, I have fun with it. Uh, it, it to me, it's, uh, it, it, I'd rather, I'll tell you this, I'd much rather be recognized and bothered than have nobody know who you are. It's a good point. It's a good point. Our fourth question, we have a catchphrase, speaking of college, started for us in college years ago amongst our friends that something's done up real good, which is just basically something's been making us happy or we've enjoyed something or we've discovered something we want to share with people. Uh, what's been done up real good for you lately? Well, I, I think it's been the reaction of the audience on our program over these last 16 or 17 months. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I know that there is this polarizing view of, of what we do, and, and that's that's okay. That's, that's part of it. I, I come to the territory. But it, it has really gratified me more than anything I have ever done to hear people call up and, and, and thank us, those who do, of us who do the show every day, for being there, especially especially early on when everything shut down, I mean, we did not miss a day. Yep, uh, we yep. kept doing the show. It was difficult. Uh, you know, we were off camera for for a couple of months. Uh, we, we had a radio signal only on the air, and then finally we got back on the air. We you know we've done the show remotely. We've done the show from studio, um, and and it's I, I've just been overwhelmed by the audience's reaction. And you know, people accuse me of, of getting soft, and but I, it's not a matter of that. It's just it's coming to, I think, after a very long career to appreciate that the audience is really uh, our friend. I mean, without mm-hmm. them, we wouldn't have a show. And I don't think I, I quite understood that as well in the past. And I don't think I, I, I ever appreciated how important the fans are to what I do and what you do and what, what all of us do. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's because you you, you conduct a good show and you conduct a stellar interview is, is one of the reasons or two of the reasons I watch. So uh, I know you're busy or you're really about to be busy in a few weeks. So it's very kind of you to share your time with us. Our, our viewers will love it. Uh, one of my favorite reads of the last several years, a lot of times I'll grab a football book to, to in August to prep me for the season. And mine, my, one of my favorites from uh, 14 was my conference can beat your conference. Uh, I really, I'm not going to hold you to it, but I really hope you have another book in you. And, well, and- I, I would say this, and thank you for saying that. Uh, sure. That book was not ever supposed to be written. Um, I had somebody call me one day and say, uh, 
I want you to, long story short, I think I may have talked about it in the book. I happened to be in New York uh, at the mm. end of the, uh, thir- uh, the tw- 2012 season. And a guy called me and said, hey, there's a, there's a literary agent up there that would like to talk to you. If you're ever in New York, I said, I'm, I'm in New York right now. Um, and the next day I went to meet him and he had an idea for a book uh, about the SEC. And we, uh, we put it together and it, it, it garnered a, a, an enormous amount of interest from publishers. And we ended up doing, doing the book. It, it was pretty much my, my first season at ESPN as the guy mm-hmm. post when I was on college game day. And uh, I, I swore afterwards that I would never do another book. Uh, it's like you, you, it was very successful and, uh, you know, I was, uh, it, but I, I have thought about it. <laughs> I have thought about another one. Um, I think everyone's thought about a book during the pandemic. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I think when the moment comes, I, I, I will do another one, but, uh, it was very special though. And I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, it's a great book. Such a, such a fun read too. Well, I will let you get back to it. Uh, and we all enjoy your work as for our viewers. We will return next week. Uh, and just thanks again to Paul Feinbaum for joining us. Very kind of him. So, Paul, take care. Well, it's, been, it's been such a pleasure to be on. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Found his finger by my mama's grave